So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Balaj Nimati. I'm based in Berlin and I do operations for the Decentralized Identity Foundation. And um, this breakout session will be sh a short introduction to the foundation and what we are focusing on at the foundation, and then uh, a broad open discussion from some of our members who joined us today. So the Decentralized Identity Foundation was as essentially focused on working around decentralized identities because currently there, is, there are primarily or only siloed services that you have heard about in today's many sessions, while a decentralized working ecosystem could work better than the current siloed ones. Um, just to have a few key points back down, it essentially brings the users to the center, it enables portable data, so there is no vendor lock-in, and it can enable a higher level of trust between services and users um, without the praying eye of a big brother-like solution. So these would be like the highest highlights that are important. There are many more features that I think might be mentioned in the discussion later. I just wanted you to like have a recap. The foundation was funded uh, three years ago by 14 companies. By now, the foundation boosts about a over 150 members. Uh, it's a rather active community focusing on everything related to decentralized identities. So it's technical and non-technical te non and industry related discussions. Um, as you might have heard, there are a lot of hurdles in technical and also there are very interesting required changes for business, uh, how to operate in the decentralized identity space. And, and the foundation's primary goal is actually to boost it and, and help to maintain the collaboration between different parties and essentially aim for interoperability. Um, the foundation's primary focus when it comes to well, the technical. Well, 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 ah, thank you. Um, so the oh, the fun the foundation is focusing on the three core layers. Um, around the, on the decentralized identity stack uh, that you can see in the screen. It's sort of, these are the more technical related aspects and the original the foundation's focus was a very technical approach to solving the outstanding problems um, that has been extended over time as, as the stack has been more established and grow quite a lot since uh, the last three years. So now we are also focusing on more soft discussions around the, the decentralized identity and not purely on the technical ones, even though it's still by far the majority of what uh, our members are doing. Um, essentially, currently we have five uh, technical working groups and a number of other open groups and open initiatives that anyone can join without a membership. And even though about the membership now, for companies under a thousand employees can join for free as a contributor. More on that a bit later. Um, the working groups have their own focus. I, it's, I don't really want to go de detailed in what these are. You can visit our website identity.foundation and learn more about what exactly each working group is doing. Um, and everyone is invited to this bi-weekly call, which happens at, at 11 a.m. Eastern time every second Wednesday. And I can send invites for those who are interested. Um, DIFF is not the only uh, community or organization that's working on on relation to decentralized identities on, on a more technical specification work. There is a number of others. And because of that and the fact that interoperability is a lot more complicated than I think initially most companies have thought, um, they've started an interoperability working group that is being established as we speak, which has a goal of creating a cost community uh, platform or in initiative where we will be, or basically the community comes together and we'll look at each uh, work item that happens across the community and try to come up with recommendations, a roadmap, and sort of like help to align the entire community to get to interoperability and get what everyone is talking about actually a reality from a technical perspective 
And so if everyone is interested to join, you can see a link on the screen or you can get in touch with me after I finished and I can send you more information as well as it's on the website. Um, some useful links, the website is identity.foundation, GitHub, and then you can find us on Twitter. Uh, we tweet time to time. And uh, yeah, this would be basically just a very short introduction to the foundation. And with that, if there are any questions, please use the chat and we can uh, reply to that later. And I would like to ask to keep this as going forward sort of the format. If there are questions, I will leave, read them out loud. And I would like to get our uh, panelists or discussionists uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they want to focus on during this discussion. We have an aim to create an open, non-managed discussion, so they will be asking questions from each other, sometimes high, sometimes light, light ones. And please don't hesitate to ask, ask questions, and I think we should go. Karil? Awesome. Thanks, Balaj. Great overview. My name is Carol Fowler. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company based in Austin, Texas called Transmute. And we use decentralized identifiers and verifiable credential technology to secure product level uh, data and global supply chains. Um, so today I'm, I'm really interested in um, focusing on interoperability. I think that's um, been a really hot topic in our community, like Balash mentioned, and it's something that is core to Transmute's business as well. Awesome, Isaac. Hi everyone, I'm Isaac from the CTO of Bloom Protocol. Um, we're based in the US, but um, our focus is on consumer banking specifically in South America. Um, we're focused on how we can use um, digital identity, decentralized identity um, to create uh, you know, portable personas across, uh, across companies. Uh, my specific focus with regards to SSI technology um, is getting data into the ecosystem. So some what a lot of people call credential issuance, uh, also very interested in interoperability. Yao. Yao, can you give a brief intro? Okay, I'm sorry, muted. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Yao Xiang, and I'm working for my key. Uh, I'm the head of research. Uh, we are building a smart contract wallet, and then we think it, it makes it easier for the user to manage their digital assets, and also uh, we think it, it's it's a, a, a better carrier for for the user to manage his identity. So uh, yeah, we we are building a uh, we we are building a wallet. That's Perfect. Thank you, Juan. Hey. Uh, so uh, yeah. It's, I work at Sterdy, which is a company headquartered in Dortmund here in Germany, and we uh, do a couple different things, but the um, product we probably want to talk about here today is the cloud wallet, which we have been um, tailoring to the pharmaceutical industry in recent months. Um, and yeah, I, I uh, was hoping to talk about uh, ecosystem sales and uh, ecosystem nourishment. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much. Apishet? Hi guys, uh, I'm Apishet, or you can call me Shake, like Milkshake. I'm from Finima. We are based here in Thailand, and uh, we are trying to enable uh, VCs and identity management methods from a federated model, which is uh, now dominated by the banks, to user-centric, then eventually SSI one day. Hey there. Um, my name is Daniel Buckner. I'm with Microsoft. Uh, I run the open source and standard side of our efforts around decentralized identity. And I think you know the most important thing for us to get across is that um, we think that this is very close to landing in a real way for, for companies. I mean, we're um, pretty keen on 2021 being the year where, where this really rolls out to um, your institutions and you know all these customers uh, in a real way. Awesome. Uh, thank you, guys. And then with that, I would like to invite someone just to start a topic that they feel important and all the others to really jump in and, and make it into a discussion.
Okay, that's not gonna work. So I would say that let's talk about interoperability first and let's start from there. So maybe Karyl, just can you kick in why interoperability matters? Um, yeah, so when we first started our, our company, I think all of us are familiar with kind of the intense aversion to vendor lock-in at this point across all the different industries. Um, but something that I think is unique to the use of um, decentralized identifier technology um, is, is this um, idea of interoperating as, um, in our case, part of our product. So we work in supply chain uh, use cases where our customers generate certain kinds of credentials today that looks a lot like paperwork that follows the products through the, the global supply chain. But what we realized is that um, we don't actually solve their problem if they can't share the verifiable credentials really efficiently across all the different players in their ecosystem. Um, and a lot of companies in this space, although I don't think any on this line, um, once you on their infrastructure um, and every player in that eco ecosystem on their on their infrastructure before you're actually able to verify that data. Um, but because that's not actually solving the problem of being able to securely share the data with all of those parties, regardless of the infrastructure it's on, Transmute has taken a really different approach and these technologies have helped us to solve this. And so I'm interested um, in, we have a lot of kind of the key thinkers um, and technologists on the line in terms of how we're actually achieving that technically. And so I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about that. So I don't know if um, Isaac or Daniel wants to chime in about how they're approaching it. Uh, Interop specifically and how we, how we achieve it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that the Probably, probably since about 2014, 2014 to 2018 was really just about, um, you know, the, the whole community was just starting up, you know, in 2014 really, um, I think it was a formative year. And it's been about three years trying to get the underlying components, the major components working. And those major components were different, really dependent on different companies, right? Companies, uh, sub ecosystems. Um, there was like Sovereign, Sovereign Ledger, they had a following. There's, you know, the Ethereum folks, like every, everyone kind of had their own little communities. And inside of those communities, they're all trying to figure out, you know, just just how to make the stuff that worked at the very most fundamental levels. Um, I, I think the last maybe 18 months have been where all of those communities, um, Hyperledger be, being one of them as well, have deployed bits that work within their own little subnets. And it's been about these last 18 months trying to come up with the glue standards that that are, you know, sort of missing to connect the dots. Um, I can give you, you know, some some examples of that. Um, one is like a a PSYOP standard. So we have OpenID Foundation has a couple initiatives to build a did capable version of self issued, um, a version of OpenID Connect. Diff has one. You know, there's a, there's another one up floating out there. Um, consolidation's happening now, right, on the authentication side. Another example is presentation exchange. So when it comes to exchanging these credentials, um, again, there's like four different envelope formats for doing this and they all kind of described a different way to negotiate like you know a user giving a credential to a, a potential verifier and with presentation exchange the spec that diff's been working on we finally kind of have one way that will unify all of those envelope formats so i think those are two examples that are indicative of the the sort of efforts that are underway right now and when those are completed i think the ecosystem will be ready for a, a broader wave of adoption by you know real customers uh, so I guess my, my internet died a moment ago. Um, am I back? Okay, I think I'm back. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so uh, the stuff that's most important to me with interoperability, first and foremost, is uh, is data schemas. So when, um, when we're trying to build out an ecosystem where one of the key value props is reusable, verifiable, um, uh, immutable data, um, we need to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. Um, so one of the big focuses that, uh, that I'd like to see um, is some is some uh, standardization across like how we just refer to users um, within JSON linked data formats. You can do a lot to say like this is the language that I'm using to describe a person and their relationship to a company or a product in relationship to a company. Um, but there are still intricacies that need to be um, that need to be very carefully thought out there. Um, so I'm uh, so we're specifically trying to get um, just the baseline schemas uh, agreed to. Um, and then trying to delegate the governance of those schemas to the appropriate industry bodies. Um, so things like, uh, yeah, so um, that, so presentation exchange is very useful uh, for that as well. Um, but yeah, the actual data schemas is particularly interesting to us. 
Yeah, I strongly agree with uh, what Isaac mentioned about data sch data schemas. We tried to, you know, uh, work on that approaches here, you know, when we began in Thailand. But then the problem we face majorly is that um, regulators, uh, the public sector, government departments especially, they are they they are really really. I mean, um, the the knowledge about verifiable credentials, and you know, it's it's very very poor. So we we basically have to really go and educate them, you know. And uh, we focus on you know enab enabling first the potential VCs, then uh, by you know letting regulators understand uh, firstly the blue three C VC standards and letting the regulators then recommend and issue the standards. Then we we try to go and uh, tackle the, the the data schemas issue. Yeah, you know, on the data schemas issue, I think this is one where. Um, you know, we could use a lot of help. I know there's a, a taxonomy initiative in DIFF that um, is still, you know, kind of forming right now, and we're, you know, really interested in contributing to. Um, I don't think any of these SSI or decentralized identity groups should really be the one making schemas. You know, I think our first option is to identify the schemas that make the most sense for various proofs that exist in the world, and then really just help to recommend those. So, you know, this is a call mostly to the audience to say, you know, if, if you're from an industry that has, you know, a, a need for these exchange of proofs in a way that's, you know, outside the boundaries of a single organization, and this is a benefit to you and you have, you know, um, the ability to help add to that, like you, you understand that there's a bank schema that's, you know, widely used or whatever, you know, that's an area where folks like myself and I think some of them's called, you know, that's not where we have our expertise, right? So we would love it if you would, you know, join DIFF and join that taxonomy initiative and help us identify those schemas so that we can recommend them and get them in front of, you know, more eyes. Uh, and yeah, I, I would just jump in there and say that um, just to transition a little, uh, this kind of uh, relying on consortia and real world ecosystems existing sort of governance makes the job of adoption and ecosystem sales 100 times easier. If you can go to people and say, hey, as an industry, this neutral body you guys already trust has thought it through and says this is what has to be in a credential it's one less thing you have to sort of negotiate uh educate wrap your head around wrap eat the client's head around wrap entire country's heads around uh so i linked there uh an article about um if you read between the lines, it's kind of about how that kind of semantic uh, or or business process standardization that has to happen in the real world can lead to you know uh, ad adoption one vertical at a time. If the vertical already has cooperative organizations, consortia of competitors, that that's just a godsend for for B two B sales and and B two B sort of market building. Uh, yeah. One question I, I have just, for yeah. the group that we could that we could talk about is um, so how are we how are you each in your companies approaching um, just like demonstrating the business case for SSI? Um, uh, like what does like a successful um, experiment or something look like to perhaps an enterprise customer where they don't have to like dive in and and start uh, having a lot of engineering overhead? Um, curious how uh, anyone on this call is approaching that. So yeah, I can go. Um, yeah, well, so here we are we are bridging the gap between uh, physical identities and uh, digital identities, right? By firstly making these like. Um, you know the, the 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 clients or public private sector understand what is actually verifiable credentials because um, for for these people like uh, in this region especially um, digital identities to them like you know they're still understanding that basically a QR code in your phone linking it to a, a card or um, you know even an image in, in in your mobile phone that's digital ready for them. So we we are actually you know going from like really ground up 
to try to educate that, hey, you know, that QR code, that's a, an image, there's no encryption at all. And this digital signature, you're using stylus, it's all image, and there's no like no, no trust in that, no encryption in that. So yeah, we are actually trying really hard to, to make them understand verifiable credentials. That's the approach. Yeah, I would add to that. Um, our our approach, we there's definitely still. I think we're kind of in the adoption, the part of the adoption curve where none of us can absolve ourselves of education. Um, so I completely agree um, that education is still a really big part of that. Um, we tend to come at it from well, we're working in spaces um, like raw materials and food imports that are more industrial. They've digitized maybe partially, um, if at all. And so in those cases, it's candidly like the, the very unsexy business process optimization cell. We try to understand where the breakdowns in their kind of business transactions and, and process management are um, and where they're having to, um, where the inefficiencies in terms of data sharing or credential sharing are and then help the customer um, understand how this technology can make the most impact depending on what those processes are. I think something that is um, really important in B2B sales, but especially just in general use of SSI kinds of technologies is looking at the underlying processes and making sure that you're not implementing something on um, on sand, right? Or on a, a process that already is broken and isn't working. Uh, because once you've codified that, that just can cause even bigger problems. And so um, our goal is to first identify where those breakdowns and inefficiencies are occurring um, and help uh, help think through where this technology can make the most immediate impact. A quick question to everyone, um, which is slightly off, but I think it's interesting for the audience is how you guys are dealing with the fact that all the standards and specs that you have been talking about are still emerging and basically they are changing on a daily basis. And and what is your approach of tracking them or, or deciding which is the which is the one that will win? Or, or that will come out as the final, final version of the of the standard that will get there at some point. Um, just because I think like we don't talk about that enough that these are still emerging technologies, mm -hmm. even though we are deploying or many of our companies are deploying that already. Maybe maybe Yao, you could start. Uh, okay, I, I I think for the for the uh, for the enterprise, uh, you, you need to, to tell them uh, with the credentials they can uh, develop new users uh, more easily because uh, uh, the wallet has their uh, users. The users uh, are registered treated in in public blockchains. So uh, the users own their identities, and uh, and uh, also we some issuer can issue some credentials to the users. So so uh, the this this uh, customers can sign to the uh, centralized services without uh, uh, other permissions. Uh, so this we 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 told uh, uh, many enterprises uh, that. Uh, Maybe this is a way to develop more uh, the new new users, uh, and uh, in in this way they can uh, they they are educated educated and they 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 are accepting these ways to do some changes uh, to accept the the uh, the ID the ID technology. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the way that, that we're kind of looking at, you know, standard selection is um, hopefully, you know, implementing something in a first wave that isn't so different from whatever gets finalized, like in this, like in the example of something like OpenID Connect self-issued, you know, for DIDs, where there, you know, are three options really out there right now, um, and we just kind of implemented one that we thought was you know, pretty close to them, um, while the decision is happening, you know, I think it's a level of confidence in looking at how how much difference and variation there could be between what you do and what is finalized. Like for those standards, 
I don't think it's going to change dramatically. Like what we're really talking about is like the 10% of difference. It's not like wildly different because the flow is already pretty described. Um, so we don't have a lot of fear there. Um, other ones like presentation exchange, for instance, um, that's one where, you know, we as an organization just, you know, we implemented something is pretty one off. A lot of organizations were doing a lot of one off stuff just, just out of necessity. Um, but the presentation exchange is some work that we kind of rapidly stood up in the community, you know, as a cross collaborative effort because we just got sick and tired of waiting for something to unify across all these envelope formats and these different options. And that was almost just born out of necessity. And I, I tend to prefer the specs that are born out of necessity um, and the ones that sort of actually try to unify across um, different options instead of making a, a variant inside of those options. So those are the ones where we look, for, I think, for opportunity is where we can like sort of take one spec that aligns a bunch of disparate choices and, uh, and work on them more quickly. At least that's the way we've been trying to approach it. Yeah. Um, I also just to echo what Daniel said, like trying to find the the specs that have like supporter momentum and and are probably not um, and are like you know kind of ninety percent of the way there um, is is great for at least um, establishing some sort of um, process to look at the business value. So for us, like we we started out, we built a couple of one offs just to get it working, um, and then while the specs started emerging, um, it's actually kind of a good time to. Um, to focus on more the on more like the back end demonstrations of of how the the business value would work. So you can do more experiments that show that could show a business like this is what it will look like. Um, and then the specs are really more important once we really need to get it set into stone um, and decentralized and and established like more on the client side. Um, so yeah, it's it's to me it's a matter of like uh, getting the, the the business case isn't going to change. It's really the implementation details um, which will change a little later. Yeah, and I think there's a, there was some talk in the chat here about, you know, the schema stuff, the semantics um, stuff more. I don't know, maybe perhaps I might, you know, not be clear on this point. Um, and I'd, I'd love to you know, have the person respond in chat. But when I talked about the taxonomy project in DIFF, I think DIFF, DIFF really isn't attempting to be a governance body for, you know, all sorts of, you know, various areas that you might think of as needing governance. Like we look at um, governance of say GS1, right? If, you, if we took, you know, in the, in the realm of schemas, if we took GS1 as an exemplar of supply chain schemas and said, look, there's no one else in the world really that, that does this thing and they are the the one. Um, we don't feel like we would need to stand up governance and diff for supply chain schemas because, you know, there's already this great organization. Um, I think the, the taxonomy work is more about identifying schemas that are broadly used in industry verticals and then simply saying, if you're going to do a credential for supply chain, you know, to certify that, you know, a good shipped or something like that, GS1's probably got that object. You know, in fact, here it is, and we recommend that you use it. And any governance around how that schema changes over time, you should go get involved in GS1, you know, because that's that's probably the, the best place to do that. So using that as an example, we would hope to replicate that recommended list of, of schema-based objects that you might transfer between credentials. Um, across more verticals, so that's where that's where we need help, and that's kind of the extent and the scope I think of this of this particular schema and taxonomy initiative is the identification recommendation of schemas. So if you're in a vertical out there um, that's underserved that we don't you know have a reflection of in diff, we'd love for you to participate and help us do that because you know we're not experts in all the fields. There's some talk in the chat also it looks like about um you know like almost like well, what i call burner dids it sounds like you know like ephemeral or you know i call them burner dids because it's more it's more edgy but uh but yeah no that's there, there is definitely thinking around that in fact like there's like the pure did spec which is kind of like burner dids um in many ways there's um certain like for instance like the side tree working group is working on a protocol that underpins um, Element, the transmit's working on on Ethereum, and then Ion, which you know Microsoft and others are working on Bitcoin, um, and that comes with a feature, this long form thing where you can create a DID that isn't even anchored to a ledger, and you can use it, and it's a fully fledged DID, um, and you you can just throw it away, right? You can just toss it if you want to, and it's real cheap and easy to to um, generate. You can use in milliseconds after you generate them. So, 
Um, so those are things that definitely the community is thinking of. I don't, you know, there's different ways to accomplish that, um, but you have options. Uh, and someone's asking about did methods. Uh, there is a, a did method on which is proposed, but this is, you know, a research project. It's a long ways off. That would be kind of a unifying method for these kind of burner identities. But uh, yeah, that's that's happening in the ID working group. Hi, Jace. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll, I'll throw out, maybe in the realm of DIDs, I'll throw out maybe something that people have different opinions on. I know in the Cytree um, reference, there's we landed a thing to be able to tag DIDs with like a four byte string um, immutable at creation so that you could say like, like imagine you had a big table, like four bytes gives you about, you know, 60 and a half million combinations, um, possible combinations. So imagine you had this big table where you could like sort of, sort of start registering types of things. Now we're all talking str strictly non-human here. So just like anything that's just a, you know, like an entity or something like that. And you could say, this is a medical company or whatever, and actually tag it did so that um, when these substrates grow to large scale in the future, you could maybe say, hey, I, I want to always follow the dids that tag themselves as this. It's not a validated tag. It's not something like, you know, where it's, substantiated by a credential. It's just to shape the network. So if you said, I wanted to follow all the companies, you might not be following like 50% of the substrate, which might be like a, quite a bit of data. Um, I'm curious if people think like, how, how do people on the call think about how we'll be able to section off DIDs and understand verticals and like, you know, have indices or crawlers that um, are able to get you just the data you want, maybe about classes of DIDs you care about. I mean, I can I can answer for pharma that uh, that makes everyone in pharma very very nervous. <laughs> they're, they're not talking about crawling as much in some industries as in others. <laughs> yeah, so I don't. To, I mean, just to clarify, we don't we don't mean the implicit thing of like you know. Remember, a did is only a ID that maps to a key and an endpoints, much like DNS today, right? Like you can have a domain name and you can have literally even the, the, the homepage of the domain be protected. Like you don't, you could give nothing out with your domain name, just like Microsoft is like corp.microsoft.com and you all trying to access it are not gonna be able to, right? Because it's like behind the corporate firewall. Um, same thing with DIDs. Like if you have a DID and a key and a service endpoint, it doesn't mean that there's gonna be anything on the other side of that service endpoint that you can read. Um, it's just a way that people can say, oh, there's a, there's a company, right? There's a company. It's like, there's a domain name. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean you're like giving away a bunch of data or something. It just means that you have a, an inroads to be able to look. So specifically. I know like I, I to extend the supply chain example, you know, one that we think is kind of kind of cool. And there's this group um, in DIFF and W3C. It's a joint group called Secure Data Storage Working Group. Um, it's kind of working on the, the underpinnings of what, you know, we in the past had called an identity hub. Um, we hope to actually see, see this in the future, like a personal data store for individuals and companies. Um, and to extend that metaphor of the supply chain, you know, what if companies in the future who all use GS1, the whole globe uses GS1 um, for these objects, their product catalogs are generally, you know, a lot of the data is public. And right now to get a product catalog from Nike or Adidas or, you know, all these different, you know, companies that ship, uh, you know, hardware, everything from different areas of the globe, you have to kind of go in and figure out their APIs. Uh, you know, they have kind of one-off processes, maybe you have to register with email. And then finally, after all that, you can um, hop in and maybe get some of this product data. The crazy part is the data is in exactly the same format across all the companies in the whole world. They just make you jump through unique hoops, right, to get to the exact same data. So what if in the future um, you could acquire the DIDs of say a bunch of shipping partners or people that you have, and you could go to their data stores and they just said, here's that same product data it's the same objects we all use and you could catalog it and you could say now i know the product catalogs of you know every public object in the world um, i think that's kind of the future i'm curious if people have thought about or they have you know ideas about on the call um daniel two things thanks a lot you have been invited to the panel on the main stage um and 
I would like to turn it into a bit of a question to the to the for the discussion parties on how do you see like the issue of having like um, the technical capacity of actually doing this versus the reality of trying to get it done with partners like how does it how does it look like in real life based on your experience and how do you think it can be improved or or what would be needed for for you or for the other party to get this a lot easier because clearly sometimes this whole topic gets very technical and and we know that in real life sometimes like some parties just want the solution and don't care that much about the technical aspects of course it's important that it's privacy preserving but when it's going to work and how it's going to work for me so like what's your experience on trying to actually get it implemented versus what is implemented do yeah. anyone um, just just jump in sure um so when you're approaching a large enterprise um, in my experience if you you have to go in through the right channels um if you go in through only like the it and technology channels and discuss like hey um, you're you're going to get start. You're going to start to get bucketed in, into certain IT projects and like compared to different things on their roadmap uh, related to all of their other initiatives. Um, it has to be more of like a, a value buy-in from the company leadership rather than seen as like an IT project for just how you're going to restructure their data. Um, because otherwise, you just uh, otherwise like it gets a lot harder to get like allocated and uh, on the roadmap of these larger enterprise customers who's who you're trying to impact. Yeah, and yeah, I definitely agree with Isaac. You know, when when we approach these uh, government sectors, right, we have to go through these gatekeepers, gatekeepers, and then uh, mostly, you know, they do not want to be identity providers. So we go through like these uh, departments where there's a lot of activities with the mass public. For example, the tax department. You know, um, everybody's doing tax filing online. So to make them understand, first VCs, right? Uh, we we try to replace them username and passwords with um, you know, these digital credentials and using the private key in your, your smart devices to, to sign in instead of using passwords. So we go with, with the very, very basic use cases first for them to understand. And then you know, once the tax department understand, for example, you know, and it wishes to do an interoperability with the, with the excise department, you know, which is another tax department, excise department. Then we, we make these private chains, private networks. Then we, we drag them on the same table and say, OK, you know, the governance framework is not yet there. You know, we're still joining the trust over IP. We are still waiting for, you know, more materials from the trust over IP, understand the trust over OIP more. So, you know, we let them talk among themselves and then do an interoperability that way. I think for us, think in terms of, oh, go ahead, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, from, from our end, in terms of implementation, where you hear us all talking about the regulators or kind of standards authorities. Um, and I think where if we kind of zoom out to a bird's eye view perspective, some of the challenges we're talking about are just normal startup challenges, trying to innovate in spaces where you have to be cognizant of the regulator's perspective and the end customer's perspective. And in some cases, they're both your end customer, um, but the kind of endorsement or approval of, of the regular regulator and the buy-in, um, they really care about some of these nuts and bolts at the standards layer that we're talking about here. Whereas maybe the end customers, at least in our case, in a supply chain, like the manufacturers or the importers um, care less about the standards. They care more about complying with those regulators and also the regular business challenges of saving money and making things more efficient. Um, and so I think if we can get the relationships with the, the um, in this case, the regulators who are often acting as the verifiers, um, that that's kind of been the first first step for us. But I think we all face the challenge of having to balance, um, in some cases, what feels like competing interests in terms of the experience of your product, um, but needing to serve both of these kind of parts of, uh, um, in order to create the market. I think a, a specific hardware to help the the enterprise to manage their to do the key management 
key management is, is uh, very helpful, and and the hardware need is needs to be uh, well integrated with their authorization system. So so the the people with the authorization can sign the message uh, easily. And I think it, it's very important because uh, you know the the people who has this, this power they do not to uh, involve uh, the, um, many uh, uh, dirty works. So 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 a specific hardware may be helpful. For. That's it. One. Oh no, I was just waving the people that were saying in chat they're on their way out. <laughs> and, and what's your experience? Uh with with uh consortium sales, I mean I think um it's it really depends because each ecosystem is different. In a lot of ecosystems, the regulators are very hands-on and they're ahead of the problem and they sort of lay things out in advance and in other ecosystems less so. Um, I mean, right now working on some FDA stuff in the US, it's it's pretty um, interesting how that stuff is kind of already sorted and they just want SSI companies to come in and build it. Like they sort of have more clarity than most ecosystems, I think. Um, I mean, largely because the groundwork was done by by <laughs> some people who maybe uh, spoke on the main stage a little while ago. Uh, but yeah, there's there's um, yeah, there's it's it's always different. And there was a lot of talks on regulators. Like, how do you see regulators and? and regulating bodies are getting to understand or embracing the broader topic of decentralized identity in in good or maybe not so good ways um, in, in sort of your respective industries. Sorry, um, I was reading one of the comments and kind of missed that question, but I, I'll respond to, um, I think, Punnett in the chat that I've been kind of chatting back in and forth with about um, um, kind of building a community around around this. Um, I think kind of to my earlier point, the verifier, um, or in the case of a lot of our use cases, specifically a regulator, understanding the minimum amount of data attributes or elements that they need to verify and understanding what they will accept. Um, it, in my mind, that's the precursor to unlocking a market where you can have other types of um, companies who then are issuing those credentials. And so for us, we've really focused on understanding the, the verifier, or in our case, the regulator side of things first. Um, and that way, we're less focused on the technical nuances when we go to sell to the other companies in the supply chain ecosystem. We can focus on um, on their needs, which look a lot different <laughs> than what the data schema might might should be, um, or what the verifier is willing to accept. So I completely agree with you. You you have to balance that, and I think the verifier uh, acceptance criteria comes first. Others read the the regulators or regulating bodies' knowledge or experience with with decentralized identity or willingness or are completely going against them. What's your experience? Yeah, me. Hi. Me? Go ahead. Uh, for the regulators, uh, I think uh, you know I, I, I'm in China, and I, I think it's it's quite um, uh, uh, much uh, difficult to to talk with the regulators. But but China Chinese uh, government is developing you know the the CBDC uh, the digital currency, and then with, with the development with digital currency, I think that the 
the government uh, can uh, be educated uh, uh, with, uh, with the new technologies. And for, for, the, for, for us, uh, for the uh, enterprise, for, for the uh, normal companies, it, it, it's, it's very hard to talk to the regulators. So, so, so uh, that's it. Well, for us, I mean, Th Thailand, uh, Southeast Asia is a bit smaller than China, and I think more accessible to, to the regulators, right? So, but the, the major problem we face is that, um, well, digital identities here is being dominated by banks. You know, they're doing the federated model. And then, uh, you know, they get a lot pr of pressure from the banks. So, I mean, it's really, really so much politics there really so much politics there to to get, getting them to understand like you know actually decentralized identity so we we have been organizing workshops after workshops and then you know once they 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 understand they try to buy the idea of you going user centric towards ssi and then the banks come back and you know pressure them so so we keep we get keep getting a lot of these fights the but yeah here i mean we we see the necessity of you know having a, a identity custodianship here because um, we we see that users uh, do not have the that literacy that high literacy to take care of their keys i mean to to, to manage their keys but i mean having said that we try to keep the i mean the control with the user so you know the private keys with the user so you know he or she could assigns certain persons or bodies to be custodians. Um, the, the, Ryan, it's not specifically related to regulators, but it reminded me of uh, just another interesting point, which um, the group might want to discuss, is uh, often when, sometimes when you go to an, an enterprise where ownership of data is their business, uh, and they feel that the data that they've accumulated is, is the core to their business model, um, We've found some ways that you can pitch this as a way to actually, you know, increase engagement with your customers by um, by opening up your data to allow them to do more and allowing them to to become kind of a key player in in the larger ecosystem. Um, but it's definitely a difficult discussion when they say, like, you know, what do you mean by opening this up? I'm giving people data, but you know, federating access to data is my business. Um, so how are you, how are you guys dealing with data brokers and um, how this shift in the industry is going to affect their business models? Yeah, and in in, in the pharmaceutical sector, I can say um, that's one where data brokers would be illegal, right? Like medical data has to be incredibly private. Um, but if you uh, can can offer to a pharmaceutical company the capability to have a direct, completely unmediated and privacy preserving connection to the client, their eyes light it up. They're like, oh, that's the one thing we thought we could never have because of our exceedingly high privacy requirements. We just assumed there isn't that sort of secure channel to the to the end consumer just jump leaping over the entire distribution chain. Uh, and that's one one thing a society makes possible that I can't imagine doing any other way. Uh, that's something we're exploring now with some clients and it's uh it's really powerful it, it really counterbalances all of this complexity in education you know or, or motivates it perhaps i think tim stas asked um if you know you could go around the banks <laughs> yes uh i think we, we we could go around the banks i mean um you know, we were trying to provide the identity fabric here, but the banks are trying to dominate, uh, letting, you know, everybody use bank IDs to verify themselves in all in all like governmental services. They're trying to dominate the, the field, basically. Well, whereas we think that, you know, a person could actually could have the option, you know, I want to use my mobile ID for this this uh, telco uh, business. I will use the bank ID for for my fa financial transactions. You know, you, you should have the option which ID you want to use. Uh, Tim, I don't know what social architecture is. <laughs> awesome.
you're interested to talk to the banks in Germany if they are driving main drivers of SSI adoption. <laughs> So I think we came to a good conclusion. We are definitely 12 minutes over the target finish of this meeting. So I'm, I may jump in to thanks everyone for, for joining us and especially with like staying longer. Um, I really enjoyed it, even though I hear a lot of these discussions on a rather daily basis. <laughs> um, I think it was good we managed well this open-ended discussion and and thanks for everyone who was using the chat for asking questions. Um, I hope or I think we hope that um, it was helpful or we, we gave you guys some insights on what the struggles and daily discussions are in in like companies that are trying to deliver this solution and, and meanwhile surviving and and building the whole ecosystem to work. Um, if anyone got interested to sort of keep up this work and then join discussions related to, to technology, then you can see some useful information uh, on the screen, as well as if you want to get in touch with any of the folks who presented or had the discussion before, then you can reach out to me. My contacts are on the screen and I can put you in touch and sort of make the make the introduction happen. Or you can also browse the many companies that are on the site and I, I can always help to get in touch with them. And sort of with that, I will conclude the meeting. I think it was super good and uh, thanks everyone for joining.